No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Sean Connery there is James Bond in the uh, popular movie Goldfinger. What's your favorite Bond movie film or Bond movie film quote? I bet the our next guest has an answer to that question. Join me right now to talk about how James Bond saved his life and his own unique brand of international espionage, which he masterly tells in his series of spy thrillers. We have New York Times best-selling author Ted Bell with us. Ted, it's great to talk to you. John, it's really good to be with you. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll get in-depth with 007 in just a moment, but first I want to discuss Warriors, your newest Alex Hawk novel. When an elderly professor, a victim of bizarre angst and Chinese torture, is murdered at Cambridge, Alex Hawk teams up with his Scotland Yard colleague and friend, Inspector Ambrose Congreve, to find the killer. But the death is only the opening move in a tense and lethal game of geopolitical brinksmanship. It sounds very intense. Tell us, tell us, or Ted, tell us what Alex Hawk is up to now. Uh, well, I'll tell you what he's doing is he's, he's got a, a, a taking a hard look at China and, and North Korea. Um, and uh, what, what's basically happened in the real world is China has extended its, uh, its international borders two or three hundred miles uh, to the south of uh, Henan uh, province w without any respect for law or anybody asking any permission. Um, and it's, it's actually just outrageous what they've done. You don't actually hear about that much on the news, but uh, that's what happened. Uh, they were going to uh, start demanding uh, permission to transit their waters and their airspace. Um, and that's, that's kind of what happens in the beginning of, of Warlord. There's a, there's a huge territorial dispute between China and its uh, neighbors, Japan and Vietnam and uh, the Philippines. And uh, Alex gets caught up in that. Um, it's, it's basically the rise of a new militaristic spirit uh, in, the, in the Chinese. Uh, armed services. Yeah, the Chinese aggression in the South China Sea is something very real and maybe it is underreported here in the United States, but certainly an area of concern and helps set the stage for this book to make it seem really real. I want to focus on Hawk a little bit more in, in him as a character. What's interesting here is he's right. more of the mold of the modern day kind of anti hero or maverick you see uh, in, in popular spy cultures more than a traditional hero. Is that the intent here? Yeah, my intent was to create uh, a 21st century Bond. Um, if you think about it, Ian Fleming wrote the first Bond book, Casino Royale, in 1953. So uh, James Bond is very much a, a creature of, of the mid-20th century. So I knew that if I was going to create a dashing, sort of elegant, sophisticated uh, spy, which is what I did want to do, uh, I couldn't make him at all like James Bond. He had to, he had to uh, swim for, for himself, and, and as a result, He's he's a totally a 21st century guy. I mean, he's he has emotions. He he bleeds when he gets hurt. He laughs. He cries. He surrounds himself with guys who he thinks are funny, and they think he's funny. He's uh, he's witty. Uh, he's passionate. He's 33 years old. He's the sixth richest man in England, and therefore he's very popular as a bachelor, possibly even more than Will or Harry. I'm just making that up, but well, maybe he's not. He's a pretty I popular mean guy. Uh, maybe not. The royal so, family's uh, so popularity is de declining a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, it is an interesting <laughs> character and an interesting contrast to James Bond. And you know, I think it also t uh, speaks to the fact that, that the audiences today aren't willing to accept that uh, their characters are infallible as maybe they once were uh, back I in the day. Now, we've recently, or I'm sorry, we, I want to talk a about the president and the whole storyline here. Uh, you know, we don't know if the president yeah. is maybe losing a step here with perhaps early onset dementia. Tell us, I know a lot of your stuff is based on reality, but where did this... You're talking about the, the fictional, you're talking about the fictional president in my book, right? Exactly, exactly, the fictional president okay, in your good. book. We should clarify. Good. I want to, to be clarify. real clear who we were talking about but here. Tell us where that storyline came from, because I thought that was really interesting as well. Um, it, it came from uh, my uh, feeling that, uh, that, you know, so much rides on, on the guy that's sitting in the White House. Um, and if he's not making good decisions all the time, it's a bad thing. Uh, and then I decided to turn that into a plot uh, part where somehow the president has this mysterious illness, um, and nobody's quite sure if it's onset, uh, early onset dementia, uh, if he's you know got serious physical problems. But everyone is questioning his fitness for uh, for office, um, including his own wife. Um, and it turns out he really is sick. Uh, but he's sick for a reason, and the reason is uh, there's a bad guy working in the White House kitchen. And it forces That's the reader to ask you. a lot of questions as well, which I think is an awesome literary technique that you use here in the movie. Uh, you know, we, we, we just talked in this interview about how most of the media's attention has been focused 
uh, in recent days on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and of course, before that, there was a lot of talk about Iran and the Middle East and Syria and, what, and whatnot. But this book focuses hard on China and the rising tension that is very real in the South China Sea, very real dangers. Um, China is increasing the size of their navy. They're pushing Japan and Korea's buttons over territory. Now, you know, you, you decided to include this. Why do you think this area is being underreported? Uh, because it is such an important issue uh, in the geopolitical uh, arena today. Well, I, I can't really answer that question, but what I can tell you is that uh, I was lucky enough to be elected a visiting scholar at Cambridge University uh, for the years 2011 2012 uh, as a member of the Department of Politics and International Studies. And I was also a visiting writer, a uh, writer in residence at Cambridge in addition to the visiting scholarship. And our whole focus uh, was on China uh, with a subset of North Korea uh, because that's where the trouble is coming from. And the people who go to Cambridge that are part of uh, POLIS, uh, the political science department, these are all future MI6 CIA superstars or assistants to presidents or prime ministers. I mean, it's the elite of the elite uh, that are in Cambridge at any given time. It is spy heaven. And I was lucky enough to be right in the middle of it for a year. And, um, and I can tell you, I, I heard and saw stuff that um, uh, I would have to kill you if I told you about. <laughs> In fact, we're required every meeting, every uh, time I walk in a room, you sign something. Uh, I think it's called the chart house rule. And you swear never to reveal who was in the room, what was said, or what the outcome was. All right. Well, we um, won't ask you and, any uh, of those questions. Uh, you want to make sure Good. you can keep your word on that. But I do want to talk more uh, about this genre. I know you want uh, uh, Mr. Hawk to be uh, different from James Bond, but you also have speak, uh, spoken yes. recently at the Reagan Library about how James Bond saved your life. Tell us a little bit about that speech at the Reagan Library. Well, I was very honored to be asked to speak at the Reagan Library, and I wanted to have a topic that was in keeping with their uh, international spy year, which they're having at the Reagan Library. And uh, uh, the truth is, is that James Bond really did save my life, um, almost literally and figuratively. I was a, a, a little typical American kid in a small town growing up. Uh, in the summer of my 12th birth birthday, I started reading these amazing books by Ian Fleming. Um, and it literally it opened my eyes to this incredible world out there beyond the small town America in the 50s that I knew. Um, and I got enormously excited, uh, not just about bullets, babes, and Bombay martinis, which was all part of it, but just the glamour of, the, of, the, of all that was going on out in the world that I had no way, you know, sitting in my sixth grade geometry class or I had no, I had no idea about this if it weren't for Ian Fleming. It could really expand and your horizons. So we got it. We we do have to run real quick, Ted, before we get to a commercial break. But wa okay. last question for you: favorite Bond movie, favorite Bond villain, and favorite Bond quote. Uh, a favorite Bond movie would be from Russia with Love, which uh, I think was was far and away. Ian Fleming would agree that was the best one. Uh, favorite uh, uh, villain would have to be Goldfinger. I love that guy. Uh, and my, my favorite quote is uh, James Bond when he's on the rack. I think it was in Nassau in, uh, in, 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 in Dr. No, I can't remember for sure. But anyway, uh, Bond says, do you expect me to talk? And, uh, and, and Dr. No says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. That is the, I that love that quote so much. I, it's indelible. I lifted it's, uh, it. My favorite as well. Movie. Favorite villain, it's in favorite the new book movie, Warriors. and favorite quote. <laughs>